This morning we, uh, we begin a, a series entitled Follow. And the thought that I want to kind of present to you to kind of think through, to wrestle through kind of an anchor idea is this, that uh, there's something significantly different between being a believer in Jesus and being a follower of Jesus. I would say this, I would present to you, there's something eternally different between being a believer in Jesus and being a follower of Jesus. There are some of you, you are here today and you come to this place maybe every week or once a month or when it works out in your schedule and, and you come here because you go, I believe in Jesus. And, uh, and that's good. It's a, it's a good start. Uh, but there's something so different, something uh, much more meaningful, something much more powerful, uh, something much more significant than, than being a follower of Jesus. And, and there's some of you, you've been a part of the church for a length of time, and, and, and you've been a follower of Jesus, but you have a tendency to just kind of slip back and just, yeah, I just kind of believe. And, and you don't allow the, the Jesus to lead. You don't allow the Spirit to lead. You just kind of believe, but you don't follow. And, and that's what we want to look at. That's what we want to be challenged over, over this series over the next couple of weeks is what does it mean to be an authentic follower of Jesus? What does that look like? Matthew chapter 4 says, As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers. He saw Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew, and they were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said this to them. He said, Come, follow me, and I will send you out to fish for people. Other translations say this, I will make you fishers of men. And the Bible says this, it says, and this is astonishing to me, it says, At once they left their nets and they followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John, and they were in a boat because they were fishermen with their dad, and they were preparing their nets, and Jesus called them, and it says here again, immediately they left the boat, and they left their, follow, their father, and they followed Jesus. Another account, James, uh, John chapter 1, it says, the next day Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, follow me. And then one other account, Matthew chapter 9, Jesus went, says, when Jesus went from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth, and Jesus told him, follow me, and Matthew got up and followed him. And this is pretty much the way that Jesus called his 12 disciples. He just walked up to them and said, hey, follow me. And over and over again, these guys just packed up everything. They dropped what they were doing, and they said, we're with you. And I've often wondered, I said, what was it about Jesus? What was it about his personality? What was it about his charisma? What was what is it about his statue that, that people would just go, I'm in? Because let's be honest, if you were at your job, if you were running in the park, if, if you were at the Walmart and some guy came up to you and said, hey, bro, follow me, you'd be like, hey, bro, I don't know you. So, so what was it? So you have to understand a little bit of the historical background of, of how this worked, that, that these men, or probably young people, probably teenagers, for some of them, would just go, yeah, we're in. Uh, how would they leave their jobs, their families, and their possessions and immediately follow him? Well, uh, some hi uh, brief historical background here. You see, in this culture, every single young boy, when they, when they came of age, started to study the Bible, the Torah. Matter of fact, they would even start to memorize the entire Old Testament in hopes of one day being recruited, being associated with a rabbi, that a rabbi would come and say, hey, uh, I've noticed your diligence. I've I noticed your skill. I, I, I've noticed your eagerness. And, and I would like for you to come and be one of my followers, one of my disciples. I'll train you with the goal, with the, with the aspiration of one day you too could be a rabbi. And, and to be a rabbi during this culture, during this season, was like the pinnacle. It was the, it was the biggest. And so every young boy would go, that's what I want to become. But you'd have to understand, and, and we get this, uh, there was only so many rabbis and there was only so many slots, there were so many opportunities that, that some boys, matter of fact, the majority of the boys never measured up, they never made the cut, they were never selected, they were passed over. And when that happened, of course, it would be disappointing, it would be devastating, and, and so uh, they would have to kind of face reality and they would go back to the family business or they would go back to some other way of life, but they had to live with the fact that their dream never happened. 
that they didn't make it, they didn't get the call. That's exactly what these 12 men had experienced. They were fishing, they were tax collectors, they were with the family business, they were back with dad. They weren't going to be able to become a rabbi and then all of a sudden, Rabbi Jesus shows up and he goes, how about you? Come follow me. And the dream was back. This is silly, but just imagine with me, uh, uh, age 51, that all of a sudden, because of some tough times, the New York Yankees, give me a call. (laughs) And they say, we know you weren't really that good in high school, and you were really less good in in college, and we know you're uh, 51 years old, and the shoulder hurts. You know why the shoulder hurts? Because I slept. Uh, I'm at the age where like this hurts and this is pinched because I slept wrong. And they go, we get that and we recognize you're a good 60 pounds overweight and you never could run very fast anyway, but we're desperate. We need you. <laughs> Listen, let's be honest. How long would it take me to leave you and my wife and my kid? I'd be like, I'm in the car now. <laughs> I'm explaining to my wife on 113, like, I'm going to the Bronx, I'm going to the Bronx. She's like, you're going to be the laughing stock of the league, that you're going to be at ESPN, they're going to make fun of the fat second base, but go, I don't care, I'm going, this is my chance. <laughs> right? This is my chance. The dream has been dead, and now the dream's back. I'm going. She's like, you have a job, you have kids, you have to mow the lawn, I'm going. That's exactly what happened to these 12 disciples. They said, why is this so important to us when we talk about following God? Why is this so important? Because every single person that Jesus invited was the bottom of the barrel. He he wasn't selecting the, the cream of the crop. He wasn't selecting the number one draft pick. He selected at the bottom. Matter of fact, in Acts chapter 4, when, when, these, when these 12 end up standing before governors and religious leaders and, and courts, they go, they, they scratch their head and they go, these are ordinary, unschooled men. These are just average guys. They're average Joes. We, we thought they would be something special. They're just regular people like us. As a matter of fact, the majority of those Jesus called were down and out. They were outcasts. They were overlooked. They were the prostitutes and the drunkards, the tax collectors. They were the sinners. Which brings us to the first of two points this morning. The first point is this. That in order to be a follower of Christ, being worthy is not required to be a follower of Jesus. This is huge because most of you walk into this place and you go, I don't feel worthy. If you ever talk to somebody, I'll invite people to come to our church all the time. They go, man, if I walked into that place, it would catch on fire. Lightning would strike that place. They go, I'm not worthy. I, I, I don't belong here. They, they, they'll say, you don't know my life, you don't know my past, you don't know my history, you don't know the things I've done, you don't know, know the things that have been done to me, you, you don't know the skeletons in my closet. There is no way I could ever be a part of that club. There's no way that Jesus would ever accept me. There's so much of my life disqualifies me from being a follower of Jesus. And there's people in this room that have believed the lie of the enemy. They go, I'll come and I'll, I'll just hope and cross my fingers that grace is available for me. But, but as far as being a true follower of God, I'm always going to be a second class citizen. And you have to understand that is all of us. Some of you are old enough to remember, we're not worthy. We're not worthy. Listen, none of us are worthy. There's so much that disqualifies. There's so much brokenness. And all of us, there's so much disappointment and so much failure. And, and, and when, we, when we think about the, the, the arrangement, I'm going to offer this to almighty, holy, pure God. That is such a ripoff. He's never going to accept that trade. And all of us, as a pastor of this church, man, I feel that way so many times where I go, God, I'm not worthy to stand in front of a group of people and, and, and share your word. I'm not worthy to be called your son. There is so much brokenness and so much lostness in me. So I get it. But in order to be a follower of Christ, you don't have to be worthy. God still says, come on. 
Come on. See, it's one thing you say, well, well, Brian doesn't know, or the overseers know, or other people know, but God knows. I'm never going to be able to pull a fast one. He knows what I've done. He knows who I am, and it's true, and he still says, I love you. I demonstrated my love for you when I sent my son Jesus on the cross. I shed my blood, not just for you, but for the entire world, and he goes, come on. I invite you. And there's some of you here this morning where you need, to, you need to just be reminded, it doesn't matter where you've come from. Matter of fact, it might work for your favor. How do I know? Because Jesus says that to him who has been forgiven much, loves much. There's some of you, you've been forgiven from a lot and you love differently. Because you go, I know I'm not worthy. But yet he still invites me. Second thing you need to know is this, that following Jesus costs something. Even for these disciples who thought, okay, this is, my, this is my second chance. This is my opportunity. It still was a risk. They were still taking a huge leap. They weren't playing it safe. Now, you have to understand, Jesus wasn't approving anything at this point. He was just beginning his ministry. And, and, and these original flowers of, of Christ lost everything to follow Jesus. They lost their jobs, their families, their safety, their security, their comfort, even their lives. All 12 of these disciples give up their lives for following Christ. The early New Testament church, we talked about this in the James series, they were scattered, they were persecuted, they were martyred all around the region. And even today, Christians are killed for their faith. Why? Because from the very beginning all the way to today, Christianity following Christ costs something. We bought into a lie here in the Western culture, the, the Western church that, 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 you know, just it, Jesus... Or my life plus Jesus equals a better life. That's not how it works. It's Jesus. It's not, it's not my plans, my desires, and sprinkle a little Jesus on it, it'll be better. No, it's Jesus is Lord, and whatever he requires of me is what I will do with my life. It cost to be a follower of Christ. Jesus said this. He said, one day when a large group of people were walking along with him, Jesus turned and told them, anyone who comes to me but refuses to let go of their father, their mother, their spouse, their, their children, their brother, their sister, yes, even one's own self cannot be my disciple. What does that mean? It means that Jesus has to be number one. We used to sing the song, I have decided to follow Jesus, no turning back, though none go with me. Nobody else gets on board. It doesn't matter. I will follow after him. It's interesting. You don't hear in the New Testament church, bless me, or you don't hear them, ask Jesus into your heart and he'll make everything easier. No, no, no. Jesus says this, anyone who won't shoulder his cross, other translations would say, anyone who won't take up their cross and follow him cannot be one of my disciples. Shoulder your own cross my question for you is, what does that look like for you, for your life? Are, are there things where you say, you know, I'm willing to sacrifice. I'm willing to lay down. I'm willing to take some discomfort. I'm willing to put Jesus first, even if it's difficult for me. Jesus tells us to count the cost. Consider the cost, because following him will cost you something. Luke, he says this. Is there anyone here who plans to build a house but doesn't first sit down and figure the cost so they know if you can complete it? If you only get the foundation laid and then run out of money, you're going to look pretty foolish. Everyone passing by will poke fun of you. He started something he couldn't finish. Or could you imagine a king going into battle against another king without first deciding whether it's possible that his 10,000 troops could face 20,000 troops of the others? Or, or if he decided he can't, would he not send an emissary or a negotiator to work out a truce? Simply put, if you're not willing to take what is dearest to you, Whatever plans or people and kiss it all goodbye, you cannot be my disciple. You go, Jesus, whatever you want, whatever you ask, whatever you require, whatever you expect of me, I say yes to you first. Every once in a while, we'll have a missionary come in or we'll share a story of someone and, and I'll be in the foyer and I'll say, what did you think of the missionary? And they say, oh, they were amazing. And, and then they'll say this phrase, they'll say, I, I don't think I could ever do that. 
And, and I know part of the statement is we're giving honor to the individual. We're saying what they do is, is really honorable. It's, it's really amazing. But, but I always, I've always had a little bit of a nag because I go, isn't that what God calls us to? That if he would say to you, leave your comfort, leave your country, leave your parents, leave your kids, leave your grandkids, leave your comfortable life, leave your big home, leave your big screen TV, and do this for me. Shouldn't our response say, God, wherever you lead, I'll go. Whatever you ask, I'll do. Whatever you require, I'm in. And if we say, I could never do that, then are we really saying, I'm not really a follower of Christ? I I know that sounds hardcore. I know that might sound judgmental. but, But let's be honest. Isn't that what we're saying? That my life is more important than the life that you have for me. Following Christ requires a sacrifice. It requires obedience. It requires self-denial. We've lost this in the Western church. You might need to lay something that you really love down to follow Christ. It might be comfort. It might be control. It might be sin. It might be something that you you love so deeply and you enjoy, but you let it go for the sake of following Christ. Listen. Listen. Jesus never said this was going to be easy. He didn't promise that everything was going to be perfect. He didn't promise that everyone's going to love us and everyone's going to go, oh yeah, that's amazing what you're doing. No, no, he promised that he would be with us and that there would be a great reward for those who endure hardship for the sake of the cross. Now you might ask yourself, you go, how does Jesus get the right to do this? Like, what authority? How, 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 do, how does he request such a hard thing? The reason that Christ is able to do this with full authority and confidence is because he did it first. He did it first. Listen to Philippians. Philippians chapter 2 says, Think of yourself the way Jesus Christ thought of himself. He had equal status with God, but did not think so much of himself that he had to cling to the advantage of what that status, uh, uh, cling to the advantage of that status no matter what. Not at all. When the time came, he set aside the privilege of deity and took on the status of a slave. He became human. And having become human, he stayed human. It is an incredible, humbling process. He did not claim special privilege, privilege. Instead, he lived a selfish obedient life, and then died a selfless, obedient death. And the worst kind of death of that, a crucifixion. Paul says, he had it all. He had the glory of heaven. He had the authority of God. And he sacrificed the comfort and position to come to be born of a virgin, to live human flesh and bone, to walk where we walked and experienced death for us. He said, if Christ would do that for us, then gives him full right to ask us to do that for him. Listen, these next couple of weeks, I want to invite you to a life beyond just believing, and I want to invite you to follow him. So how do I do it? Well, well, well the best way to follow someone is to get close to them. You, you've done this. You've, you've been going someplace and you get in your car and you go, hey, follow me. And, 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 and have you ever had a person who has a hard time like f- keeping up with you and you look back and you're, you're like, man, like keep up. And they get two or three car lengths away and now another car gets in and then a truck gets in. You can't see them anymore. And you're like, hey, if you're going to follow me, you got to stay with me, bro. Right? Because I'm going to make a left and you're going to go straight and then I'm going to be frustrated because I'm like, where'd he go? And In order to follow someone best, you stay close to them. Jesus said this in John chapter 15. He said, remain in me as I remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. What does remain in Christ mean? It means making Christ the center of your life. It's first. I want to give you three ways during this follow season for you to put Christ first in your life, for you to stay close. The first one is this. Well, it's going to be daily, weekly, monthly, daily. I I want to ask you over the next couple of weeks to make a determination and make a commitment to, to discipline yourself, to set aside every single day some quiet time with God. 
And I'm going to present it this way. I'm going to challenge you to set aside 15 minutes a day, three five-minute segments. The first segment is a worship segment. I'm going to ask you to, however you get your music, take five minutes and just listen to something that would be God-honoring, a worship song. The song's usually about five minutes. And just worship the Lord. Just worship the Lord for five minutes. Then I'm going to ask you to take the next five minutes, I'm going to ask you to spend some time in his word. Uh, I use an app on my, on my phone. It's called YouVersion. In the YouVersion app, there's all sorts of reading plans, and, and, uh, and it usually takes about five minutes for me to just kind of read through. And, and, uh, and what I do, because um, I get distracted, you could actually have them read it to you. So I'll have it play out loud, and I'll follow along. And so I'm hearing it, and I'm reading, and it helps me just kind of remember better. Uh, I'll do that often. Five minutes in worship, five minutes in the Word. And then I'm going to ask you to set aside five minutes in prayer. Every single person can do this. It doesn't matter how young or old you are. Fifteen minutes a day to say, God, I want to follow after you. Now, some of you may already do that. Some of you may do it longer. Some of you have ways that work for you. Now, listen, there may be some days where you go, I listen to two worship songs. There's some days where I was like really into the verse and I looked up and I'm like, oh, it's seven minutes, it's ten minutes. Maybe sometimes you've got a lot going on you pray. You can certainly... Do more. You can make your own system. You do what works for you. But I'm asking you, do it. It's part of following Christ. It's, it's part of the discipline of spending time with God. It's not something we have to do. It's something we get to do. Now, most preachers will stand up here and tell you, you should do it at the beginning of the morning. You should start your day with the Lord. And if that works for you, do it. Some of you ease into your day, like you wake up groggy, you get a cup of coffee, you sit, you get your Bible, and you know, that's kind of how you start your day. Uh, I'm not that person. I don't ease into anything. Um, so I, I'm just telling you, because for me, years, pastors have said, start your day in prayer, and, and I'm miserable. I'm, I'm lousy at it. Uh, too much information, but I wake up, I use the bathroom, and then within two minutes of that, I'm doing push-ups. And my brain is just going boom, 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 boom. I, I ease out of the day. So if you did this, some of you go, if I prayed at night, I'd be asleep in a second. Again, what works for you? But at the end of the day, oftentimes, I get my phone, I look at my scripture, I take some time in prayer, and then I go to sleep. And it works, it works, better, for, works better for me. All I'm saying is do what works for you. Do what works for you, but set aside 15 minutes every single day. But there's something about solitude. There's something about setting apart time to be alone with God, to, to unplug and to withdraw from the noise and the business. I've heard people say this. And it catches. I've heard people say, I hear God best in the shower. I believe it. You know why? Because for many of us, the shower is the only place that's quiet in our lives. For most of us, there's noise and there's busyness and there's distraction. That's the only place that we're by ourselves. It's the only place that we get alone. So it makes sense that that's the place where many people go, that's where I hear God. Listen, God can speak to you someplace. The, the shower is okay. You go, that's my prayer closet. Hey, if that works for you, the shower is okay. I got my worship there. I got my, what, hey, if that works, set aside 15 minutes. Number two, so it's daily, it's weekly. I, I want to challenge you, um, and, and some of you already do this, but I want to challenge you to make Sunday morning worship a staple of your life. There's something important about gathering as a family. There's something important about putting yourself in a place to experience Jesus, to setting yourself up to never miss out on the potential work that God has for you. Now listen, I know there's some Sundays where you come and you go, yeah, it was just Okay. And there's some Sundays that you show up and you go, man, it was like God just speaking to me directly. And, and some weeks you go, yeah, I enjoyed it, it was good. And, and, and other weeks you go, man, that's exactly what I needed. You can't predict that. You can't predict when God's going to show up in your life and, and, and it, he's going to use the word or he's going to use the lifting up of voices in worship or a personal testimony. You never know when God's going to do something unique or touch you in a powerful way. But I would say that every single time we gather is important. It's like a meal. There's some days on a Monday, you know, my wife might make something. On Tuesdays we get pizza. And some days you go, yeah, that was fine. Some days we go, all of them are important. All of them help sustain me through the week. There, but there's some days where you go, honey, you bang that. That was amazing. That was great. And there's other days where you go, yeah, it was dinner. 
But, but every single meal is important in the, in the success and the energy and the fuel for your life. I would say the same thing with Sunday morning. Every service is important, but some services you're going to go, that was especially good. But you don't know. But make a commitment to God. Make a commitment to your family. And here's the commitment I want you to If you're home on a Sunday, be in church. Meaning we're not traveling. We're not. If you're home, be in church. Listen, you don't wake up on a Monday morning and your kids go, hey, dad, are we going to school today? You go, it's Monday. Yes, we're going to school. You don't wake up on a Tuesday and go, am I going to work or I'm not going to work? No. So why on a Sunday morning do you wake up and go, are we going to church? I don't know. You guys feel like going to church? No, Sunday morning is the day we go to church. Monday morning is the day you go to school. Tuesday is the day you go to work. Like, just make it a staple of your life. It's so important. Daily, weekly, and monthly. I want to give you two opportunities. Well, I'll give you three opportunities for monthly. The first one is this. As a church, we're going to invite you to be a part of something we're calling Encounter. It's an Encounter Day. An Encounter Day is going to be the second Tuesday of every month, and we're going to invite you to come and, uh, well, we're going to ask you really a few things. We're going to ask you to set aside that day. If, it, if this hasn't been hard enough for you, I'm going to make it really challenging. We want you to set aside the second Tuesday of every month to pray, to fast, and to worship. This Tuesday, we're going to ask you to set aside this day to pray, to fast, and to gather and worship. Now, the prayer part is, is this. You're going to set aside time throughout the day, more than normal, more than just your normal 15 minutes. You're going to have a couple 15-minute windows, and you're going to seek after God. It's going to be a different day. It's a day set apart. We're going to fast. Now, this is, this is a stretch for some of you. But as a follower of Christ, when we look at the teachings of Jesus, Jesus says these words numerous times. He says, when you fast. He never says, if you fast, it was understood as a follower of God that fasting was going to be a part of your experience with God. Now, I don't have time to get into it. And, I, and I'll be honest with you, I'm not sure if I understand it completely. I don't know how fasting works, but I know it's supernatural. I know there's something about when you deny your flesh and you seek after God, when you take that time that you would have used for purchasing and preparing and consuming food and you go, I'm going to use that window because now we can't say we don't have any time because this is the time I usually have breakfast, this is the time I usually have lunch, this is the time I usually have dinner. I'm going to set aside that time to seek after God and pray. And God does something. He shows up. So for those of you who want logistics and how to do it, I'll just tell you the way that I'm doing it, the way that I've invited our overseers, our staff to do it. Tomorrow night, whenever you stop eating, for some of you it'll be at dinner, some, some of you it'll be at snack time. For me, it'll probably be at their second snack time. Right, where I go, okay, that's enough. Then stay from that time until after the encounter prayer service, I'm not going to eat. So you sleep through the night, and you wake up in the morning, you go, guess what? I've already fasted eight, nine, ten hours. Right? Look at me. That wasn't that hard. I got ten hour fasting. That morning you get up and you go, I'm going to spend time with the Lord. And then at lunchtime, you go, I'm going to spend time with the Lord. And then at dinner time, you're going to spend time with the Lord. And then you're going to come out and be a part of a worship experience with us on Tuesday nights, the second Tuesday night of every month. And we're going to pray. If you can't be here, you got young kids, you got work, you can pray at home. But we're going to pray. We're going to seek God's face. And at the end of that time, then that evening, we're going to break our fast. And right there, you're going to fast almost 24 hours for some of you, maybe even longer. And, and, and this is what's going to happen. There are going to be times throughout that day where you're going to feel hungry and your stomach's going to growl and you're going to allow that to be an alarm clock to remind you to pray. Instead of being grumpy about it, instead of patting yourself on the back, oh, I'm so awesome, God must think I'm wonderful. You're going to go, no, no, no. As Just as I'm desperate for food, I'm more desperate for you, God. And you're going to pray. And you're going to see God do something in your life that's going to be different than you've ever experienced. And, and imagine if 500 people who are part of Coastal all set aside praying and seeking God's face together and then come together on a Tuesday night and worship the Lord. Imagine what God will do. 
every Tuesday night, we're, we're committed to this every Tuesday night. I mean, the second Tuesday night, every month, we're going to do this. The only exception is this, that the night of the, in November, we're going to switch it. The night in November, we're going to switch it to the night before the election. We just feel like it'd be good for our church to pray for our nation on that night. So November will be different. But besides for that, second Tuesday, you put in your calendar, second Tuesday of the month, I'm going to, I'm going to be here. I'm going to come pray. Monthly. There's other opportunities for things, for you to do things monthly. We have our community groups. We have an alpha group that if you go, I want to, all that. But I want to give you one last commercial and then we're going to pray. This is follow. And this is the follow discipleship we're doing. Mike, this past week uh, at our one service, talked about how this has impacted his life. It's, a, it's an opportunity for you to sit with, a, with a, uh, a spiritual coach and learn what it is to move beyond believing and to follow. It's going to talk about things like fasting. It's going to talk about things like prayer. It's going to talk about things like sharing your faith. It's going to talk about things like generosity. And so if you would want to have a spiritual coach, someone who, you would end up meeting with the, the way it works. Forgive me, I'm, I'm, I'm not doing a really good job at this. Seven chapters. In each chapter, there's, there's a day. There's seven days in, in, a, in, a, in a chapter that you would do your devotional. Scripture memorization, a teaching, a prayer. And at the end of that week, you would meet with a coach. We would marry you up with someone in our church, like eHarmony type thing. We would, you know, get you with another person. We'd marry you up. And, uh, and you would meet with them, Dunkin' Donuts, Starbucks. I usually just ask someone to take me to lunch. So, um, you know, Mike said he wants me to, but I said, okay, that's going to cost you seven lunches. He goes, it's worth it. So I just pick really expensive places. I eat a lot of food, and then it just, no. We just get together. So what do you think of the book? It's not counseling. We're, we're not going to get into your prayer. Go, what do you... Jesus said this, what do you think of that? And if that's something you want to be a part of, this is how you do it. At the end of our service today, you go to the information center and there's a first step packet. You say, I just want the, I want the follow first step packet. You go and you just start working through that. And then at the end, it'll give you instructions. You can find information on the tab on, on our church center app. But we want every single person to go through this in our church. Now, some of you have been seasoned Christians. You've been following God for a long time. And here's the challenge for you. We want you to go through it because we would love for you to be a follow coach. That when people come to our church and they go, man, we're hungry for the things of God. We don't know what it means. We go, oh, we got a person you can sit down with. And you just teach them what you know. You just talk with the book. Listen, church, God wants to be close to you. Now, the question is, are you willing to pay the price to follow him. Are you willing to decide to become a follower of Jesus? Yes, you're unworthy. Yes, it's going to cost you something. But would you commit to getting close to him, remaining in him daily, weekly, monthly? We believe that's what God's calling us as a church to take that next step.